Hello, Tony. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. I had a little difficulty earlier with the audio. Okay, great. Hi. Just sending a quick note here to Wendy. All right, we're right at 1030. I'm going to give us about three minutes to give others a chance to join before I jump in. Good morning, everybody. Slowly starting to join. Um, it's 1032. I think I'm going to give us at least one more minute to get some others to join. And then we'll dive in here. We've got our slides up. Thank you, Wendy. And we'll be ready to go here in just a second. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I've gotten a message. A couple of us are going to be joining. I'll just let the clock tick over to 1034. Thank you all for your patience. I'm just going to give it a couple more seconds. And I know we'll have others join as we go. There we go. Okay, so welcome everybody. My name is Tom Esselman. Welcome to our monthly Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion meeting. Uh, I am really thrilled that you guys can join us. I know there's others who have indicated to me that they're going to be coming in a few minutes late. Uh, I'm really happy about today's topic and I'm glad you all uh, joined us because I think we've reached an inflection point uh, both nationally and locally with respect to digital inclusion. And um, so, you know, one of the main purposes of today's meeting is to try to find out how this meeting can be um, helpful and valuable for each of you in participating. So um, what I'm going to do is, um, is do a little bit, uh, just a slightly um, uh, enhanced version of our um, kind of overview and introduction. Before then, I'm going to do individual introductions for the meeting, uh, and and hopefully you'll understand why. Because I want to kind of really set the table on who we are as a coalition, why we exist, what we're doing. Um, you all see every month we put up our vision and our mission, uh, and I just want to add to it nothing formal. Uh, but the main purpose of this group, it is a group run by uh, totally volunteer, totally volunteers, uh, no paid staff, no real formal structure. Um, it's just that we started this six years ago on the basis of making sure that every month um, interested people and organizations would have a place to get together, share information and learn how to access resources and participate in things. Um, and if you go to the next slide, which talks about uh, um, how to connect with us, you know, we well, just, yeah, that's, uh, that's really important. We've created these mechanisms for um, uh, any of you and anyone else out in the community to interact with us. And then if you go to the next slide, we have a steering council and we get more questions about the steering council than anything else. So I just wanna give you a very brief history of the steering council and why today's agenda is going to talk about digital inclusion at both the national level and the local level. Um, you know, we started back on the back of, of uh, Google Fiber coming to town and the bot, the two mayors, the by state mayors uh, committee on uh, in innovation created the context and the landscape for us to have a coalition. And at that time, there were what we have started to call kind of the anchor institutions who were part of that gathering, starting with the cities themselves, the municipal governments of Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. Um, although the uh, Kansas City, Missouri was the only formal member from a municipal government perspective become, to become the first kind of anchor member of the steering council. Um, added to that was Connecting for Good at the time, which was involved in creating Wi-Fi networks kind of side by side with Google Fiber and with the city's help. Um, uh, Kansas City Digital Drive, which was actually formed by the mayor's, the Bi-State Mayor's Commission. Uh, and then Kansas City Public Library, because of its geographic footprint and its leadership um, in getting involved in digital inclusion issues. Um, and then um, there was one other member, which, you know, I've, in looking back, I would say, you know, really helped us kind of stay ahead of the curve, uh, particularly with respect to um, equity and inclusion. And that was the Linwood YMCA. I don't know how many of you remember Stephen E. Smith, who was the uh, executive director of the Linwood YMCA, also became kind of an anchor member of the steering council. And after a few years, when she left, we were fortunate enough to have active involvement of Ina Montgomery. And Ina uh, is an entrepreneur. She represents the educational landscape, but she has really been the conscious for us of keeping the focus on equity inclusion, um, you know, within the, the 
kind of steering council heartbeat of what the coalition is all about. Um, but I also wanted to tell, make sure you all, you were all aware the, the rationale for this steering council, number one, staying as part of the steering council. And number two, why do we care about this split between national and local? Uh, but back in 2015, Michael Limata, who was the founder of Connecting for Good, he was tapped to be the first manager for the Department of Housing and Urban Development at the time of uh, what was referred to as Connect Home. Uh, it was a national initiative to make sure uh, all, all members of that lived in uh, HUD properties would get access to free internet. And it really put a spotlight on not only Connecting for Good, but all the activities the coalition had been doing in Kansas City. Uh, at that same time, Carrie Coogan, who had just at that time just recently joined the public library, she um, started to focus a lot of her efforts on what was going on around the country. She got to know, she got to know Angela Seifer uh, in uh, Columbus, actually had Angela visit Kansas City, seeing what we were doing with the coalition. And in the summer of 2016, that literally was the impetus for the creation of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance here in Kansas City. Um, but Carrie had a huge role to play in that, along with her boss at the time, um, Crosby Kemper, who was the executive director of the Kansas City Public Library, and, and through whom both Carrie and um, Crosby got the Kansas City Public Library and everything we're doing through the coalition actively involved with groups like Shelby, which is schools, hospitals, and um, libraries broadband coalition in DC. Uh, the National Telecommunications and Information As uh, Administration, NTIA, uh, as well as the IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Li Library Sciences, on which a board of trustees, Crosby Kemper, now sits. So that, so that has created, uh, that has further reinforced the link between the work we do in Kansas City on a local level and what's happening on a national level. Another aspect, I don't know how many of you are aware, uh, the founder of PCs for People, Casey Sorensen, uh, he was invited in 2015, same time frame, uh, to the Obama White House. And he presented the work that PCs for People was doing at that time to turn business um, uh, electronics recycling into refurbished computers that get distributed to low income uh, communities around the country. And, and Casey got a challenge from the Obama team to say, how can we turn this into a multi-million dollar initiative. And that's one of the reasons why, um, if you fast forward to just a year ago, Connecting for Good became part of PCs for People here in Kansas City. Uh, and we now have markets around the country on the basis of a challenge that was given to PCs for People by the Obama White House. Um, so, uh, and by now, um, you know, PCs for People has gotten a license from the Federal Communications Commission to work with the major ISPs, uh, as well as with city and state owned fiber to start becoming the, a last mile provider of uh, affordable internet. We've also been approved as a provider of the emergency broadband benefit um, subsidy. So it keeps the work that we're doing very much on this balance between the local and the national. And then the last thing I'll say is there's a lot of other members of this coalition who clearly uh, balance every day in their work. Um, the perspectives from digital inclusion on both a national and a local level. Any of our ISP partners who are on the call, um, nonprofits like uh, Literacy KC, which has received national recognition and funding for their uh, unique and widespread impact on literacy. Um, I think uh, ASTEAM Village, uh, the connections they have with the National Black Engineering Group and just the widespread recognition they've gotten uh, and many others. Um, so with that being said, it's the rationale for why today, uh, you know, we look at what's happening around the country and we see a, a, a huge increase in awareness uh, as well as funding opportunities across all three legs of the digital inclusion stool, you know, internet in, um, infrastructure, uh, devices, uh, and certainly training and digital literacy resources. Um, so what that leaves us with is two questions that we wanna answer today. The first one is basically, how do you interact with 
digital inclusion resources on both a national and local level? And then how can the work that we do here in this coalition, um, you know, adapt and add more value? And the way we want to do that is we want to make sure we're hearing from uh, each kind of category of participants in this coalition. Uh, we've created six. Um, we've listed five here, but we have a, a sixth one with it, which is other. And so what I'm going to ask you to do now is I'm going to do introductions. And what I'd like you to do is just introduce yourself, tell us which organization you're from. And Wendy Pearson is going to help me keep track of whether you would categorize yourself as uh, an internet service provider, uh, a government member of a government organization, both local or national, uh, uh, education or school organization, that would be third. Fourth would be a nonprofit. Uh, fifth would be a business, meaning a non ISP business or uh, corporation. And then six would be other. If you know, a vol you could be a volunteer member of a religious organization, you know, a lawyer, oh, just kidding, uh, or, you know, media journalist. Um, but we just want to uh, have you introduce yourself and put, just say which of those categories you fall into. And then quite simply, the agenda will be talking for about half of the meeting on some national level of things that you interact with, and then the other half about, no uh, about local things. So that being the case, I'm going to hand over to Wendy Pearson to for her to introduce herself and then we'll go from there. Wendy? Thank you so much, Tom. I'm Wendy Pearson. I am with the Kansas City Public Library where I serve as strategic initiatives manager. Fancy way basically of saying I oversee the programs and services that promote digital literacy and digital inclusion among especially adults in the Kansas City, uh, Missouri area. And we do that through several different um, programs and services, including Tech Access, um, which hopefully you've heard of by now. And definitely consider my organization a nonprofit. Great. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, Megan McNaughton? Yes. Hi, everyone. Oh, my camera acting up. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan McNaughton. I am the Tech Access Coordinator at Kansas City Public Library. Um, I am on the Tech Access team with Wendy, um, and I do a lot of getting devices out into the community, providing digital literacy courses, um, and ensuring that all people have access to technology, and if they don't, we can help them find how to connect to technology. Um, I also work at the library, so my answer is also really easy. I am in the nonprofit sector. Excellent. Thanks, Megan. Ann Mackey. Um, yes, um, I'm uh, president of the um, Friends of the Public Library, Kansas City Public Library. And basically, um, we kind of raise money to donate back to the library for projects that they have going on. Good. So would you... Our nonprofit organization. A nonprofit, okay. Mm -hmm. You're also acting as a volunteer, it sounds like, as well. Yes, so I'm a volunteer. Appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you, Anne. And how about Carrie Stewart? Hi, Carrie. Good morning, uh, Carrie Stewart. I am the assistant director of the William T. Kemper Foundation at Commerce Bank, and I don't know where I fit in, Tom. I maybe uh, you're funder. Um, you're uh, you. I think we probably would put you in the other category only because we didn't create a a, um, a category for funding organizations. But um, that's okay. I yeah. um, like it when I'm not, you know, creating a category. Yep. Of <laughs> well, you've never fit into a mold, Carrie. I so know that's it's true. <laughs> uh, okay, Donnell Hammond. I thank you, uh, Donnell Hammond, Director of Technology at the Coffin Foundation. Um, so we're a nonprofit organization focused on connectivity um, across um, and focused locally, uh, specifically around uh, bridging the, the gaps within education and, and new and people wanting to start or grow their businesses. Excellent. Thanks, Donnell. How about Elaine, Bill you? Yeah, hi guys, good morning. I'm also with the Tech Access team. I am the Tech Access Awareness Coordinator. So I have the lovely joy of working with Wendy and Megan and a few others on the call as well. So 
I am added to that nonprofit KC Public Library pool. Very nice, thank you. Um, it looks like Union from of KU, Union So. Yes, Welcome. Uh, <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Hen Jin So. I'm uh, the director of KU Center for Digital Inclusion. We provide uh, digital skills training to marginalized populations in Kansas and Missouri. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for joining us, Hen How about Jill Jolliker? Hi, Jill Jolliker. I'm the Assistant County Administrator for Douglas County, and I am in the facilitator for our digital equity and inclusion team in Douglas County, uh, Lawrence, and um, I'm clearly a, a government person. Yay. <laughs> Don't be ashamed. We love you. <laughs> uh, Joe Robertson. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Yeah, I'm nice uh, to yeah, see Joe. You. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, yeah, Joe Robertson with Link, the Local Investment Commission, and uh, I'm not. We fit in a couple categories. Maybe we anchor ourselves in schools, you know, before and after school programs in Kansas City Public Schools, Hickman Mills, Grandview Center, and some others. Um, so we're very much part of education, but we our, our caring communities go beyond the schools as we uh, we support families and neighborhoods and all their needs, including uh, digital digital connectivity. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, uh, Joe. I, I'm not sure where do we, uh, I think educational institution or- I went ahead we, and put them in both nonprofit and educational. And, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot oh, yeah, of sense. If we can claim two categories, we'll yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're nothing if not flexible, Joe. Um, looks like John Fitzpatrick, is that you, John F? Yes, it is, Tom, thanks very much. Uh, John Fitzpatrick from KC Digital Drive. Uh, we probably would categorize ourselves in a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, Leslie, Scott. Hi, I'm Leslie Scott um, in the ironies of all ironies. Uh, my backup laptop does not really pick up my wireless very well. So I'm sorry, I'm off camera. Um, I'm uh, the manager of the Internet Access Support Program for KC Digital Drive, and will also be heavily involved with our um, Kansas Digital Equity Collaborative project that we're embarking on um, in the next few days. And nice. we're a nonprofit. Nonprofit. Excellent. Thanks, Leslie. And Mary Kay Morrow. Hi, Mary Kay. Hello, are you there, Mary Kay? Sorry, Tom. That's uh, okay, hi. Hi, thanks for helping us all take stock today um, at this particular juncture, so this will be great. Um, I'm in the educational realm. Uh, Literacy KC is an adult low literacy educational program. Um, and I coordinate the digital program uh, with Literacy KC. So. We rely on many of you as our partners to provide two legs of the stool, which are the devices, Tom, and also the uh, internet service. And so we uh, major in the training piece of it. We're on the front lines teaching students every day how to use a computer. Great. Thanks, Mary Kay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a new um, participant joining us this morning, Mike Heckman. Hello, Mike. Tom, thanks. Thanks for, for including me and, and, and providing the invite. I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. I'm from a, <clears throat> excuse me, a small, small firm called Rock Creek Way, uh, but probably more appropriately, I'm here, uh, really here as a, as a participant or representative with KC Rising with the intent to learn a lot about this topic in support of the broader, excuse me, the broader community strategy related to digital access and, and, and equity. So I, I am excited to hear from you all today and reserve the right to call all of you individually and learn a little <laughs> bit more in the future. Um, personally, I, I also have a strong about 20 year bend toward healthcare and I'm very personally interested in the impact of, of digital access and equity as it relates to healthcare consumption especially in this sort of post-COVID age where telehealth and at-home care and associated connected devices 
um, are ultimately going to become an important component to receiving healthcare. Terrific. And Mike, uh, Rock Creek is a uh, is a consulting firm, right? Could we list you as a as a business? Uh, Please, yes, entity? that'd be great. Okay. That, that that would work. And it's just to help us provide um, some clarity about the uh, types of organizations who join this meeting. So I appreciate yep. that. Sure thing. Um, and uh, a uh, uh, one of our presenters in our last month's meeting is with us again. Th thanks for joining us. Quest Moffat, if you want to do a quick intro. Hey, good morning. How's it going? Um, I'm from Block Knowledge um, and Kadogo, but we're Block Knowledge. We are a startup studio and a nonprofit. So we're in that space. We, oh. Excellent. Yeah. So nonprofit work. Good. Glad you're joining us again, Quest. Uh, uh, Rachel, Rachel Olhausen. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So I'm here with Jewish Family Services of Greater Kansas City. We've especially focused in the last year on technology access for older adults, um, but I'm our program operations manager and supervise home maintenance, which also sometimes includes some soft tech support and setup for folks um, ages 60 plus. So we are definitely squarely a nonprofit. Fabulous, thanks, Rachel. Uh, how about Ron Green? Hi, Ron. Hi, guys. How are you all? I'm the uh, I'm Ron Green, the executive director of DigiStory KC. We're all about training people, especially youth, in digital media skills, digital communication skills. And we realized early on we couldn't get very far down that road if they didn't have the right digital devices, access to broadband and all of the other basic elements of working digital. Fabulous. Thanks for joining us this morning, Ron. I haven't seen, seen you in a while and looking forward to catching up. I know you've been actively involved in the uh, rehab work of the original Disney studio, uh, which is an exciting new mm -hmm. addition to the Kansas City cultural landscape. Uh, let's see who next, Scott Pomeroy. Hello, I'm there Scott Pomeroy. I'm uh, with the company Smart City Media. Uh, we do the um, kiosk that you have there in Kansas City. Um, I'm based here in Washington, DC, where I'm a member of the um, Connectivity for All Steering Committee, uh, which is focused on the same issues as uh, the coalition. Um, and I'm happy to be participating in Kansas City, which is my hometown originally. Um, Excellent. And so uh, what we're looking to be able to provide is to be able to use the kiosk to help to promote the messaging that uh, you need to communicate to the general public. And uh, so I want to be able to work with uh, people on putting together that messaging and getting it out onto the uh, nearly 100 screens that we have uh, available there in the Kansas City area. Fabulous. Thank you, Scott. Glad you could join us this morning. Uh, next is Steve Chu. Hello, Steve. Uh, all right, I'll come back to you, Steve. No problem. Just want to give you a chance to introduce yourself. Uh, how about Tony Lupino? Uh, good morning, everyone. Tony Lupino with UMKC. I guess I have two hats on here under educational institution. Uh, I'm with the uh, UMKC Digital Equity Working Group that you'll hear a little bit more about later. And I'm part of the steering committee for the UM system, uh, the statewide broadband initiative. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, a little bit extra on some of the work going on at UMKC right now, uh, which I'm excited to, to share with you guys. Uh, Tracy from the health department. Good morning. My name is Tracy Rowland. I work with the city of Kansas City, Missouri health department. Um, I don't know what else. I'm obviously a government agency. Yep. Yes. And a regular, a regular participant as always. Yes, Thanks sir. Tracy. Good to see you. You as well. Uh, William Crumpler has joined us. 
Yes, hello. Uh, William Crumpler, I work as a digital inclusion program coordinator in Marifor Vista with KC Digital Drive, which I believe you all know, already have up there. Yeah, excellent. Glad you could join us. Anybody else on the call? I think Jeremy Higley joined. Jeremy, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Higley, uh, working community development for the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Excellent. And, and Jeremy, I know you missed the introduction, but I'll, I'll get us into the agenda here uh, in just a second. Is there anyone else on the call who did not have a chance to introduce themselves? Um, I noticed, and, and Wendy, this whiteboard is so helpful. Typically, we do have participants from the internet service provider category. Uh, anyone from either Google Fiber, AT&T, uh, Verizon, uh, T-Mobile, uh, we have regular uh, participants and this month we don't and uh, we'll be reaching out to them um, uh, by email following this meeting. We, we just want to make sure as we talk about how each of you interacts with digital inclusion resources on a national and local level, we are getting that perspective relative to the, the different categories of organizations represented in this meeting. Um, and that's what I want to do right now. And just a, a reminder to some of you who joined late, uh, we did a very brief kind of recap and history of this coalition uh, and the degree to which this coalition has always existed, at least since 2015 and 2016, uh, very much a balancing act between what's happening on the national level with groups like the NDIA, uh, as well as on the local level, just with the work that we do uh, uh, with and amongst ourselves and the community. Um, but there's so much going on right now in terms of um, a greater awareness, um, greater interest and greater, greater amounts of funding. Um, and, and I know a couple of the uh, consultants who are working directly with us here today, uh, as well as the, the university and others uh, are specifically working on behalf of how we can make funding opportunities and other ways to get involved and to get resources um, uh, easier for all of us. And so what I wanna do is just make sure we hear from you as participants in this call. And uh, the first thing, and Wendy's gonna help me, uh, I wanna hear basically the answer to this question. How do you interact currently uh, with resources on the national level. And I, I put the NDIA out there as the primary one because they have um, quite a widespread presence. They have a, a listserv with regular emails going on, but there's other national groups that we don't know about. So we wanna go across the groups and hear from any of you who speak up. And that's the question we wanna start with on a national level, who are you interacting with and what are you getting out of it? So let's, let's start, Jill Jolliker, with you and Douglas County. Uh, how would you share with us how you're working with any kind of national digital inclusion resources? All right, Jill, if that's okay, if you've, if you've left, stepped out for a second, I could also ask, uh, Jeremy, I know you're a big participant in both local and national initiatives. Just wondering if you could give us some perspective on the, the, the groups and resources you interact with on a national level and um, in, what, in what context you work with them. Sure. Um, so there's, there's a few that come to mind in different regards. Um, one, just from a, a source of information, um, the, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance um, has a, a podcast series on broadband expansion efforts that are locally led. Um, and I don't, I don't know how much it's applicable to, to this group, but for folks that are, are curious about what local communities are doing to expand um, access to affordable broadband through um, municipally owned networks or electric co-ops or um, other, other uh avenues, it's a, a good way to stay up to date on what's happening in a, on the technological front and it's done in a non-technological way so it's easy to understand. Um, I also partner with the 
um, National Telecommunications and Information Administration. That's the federal agency that funds, um, well, that manages a lot of the federal grant funding for broadband expansion and adoption. Um, I, I partner with them to co-host some uh, a summit for state broadband directors twice a year. And that's been a great opportunity for me to, to keep my uh, pulse check on what's going on at both federal and state levels. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity um, if, if folks haven't looked into the uh, infrastructure bill, um, there's there's significant funding in it, assuming it passes um, for state governments to start um, significant expansion of um, affordable um, device programs, affordable internet programs and digital literacy uh, training across a variety of, of audiences and constituents. So uh, last thing I'll say is, what's that? Those are those are um, NTIA and the uh, Institute for Local Self Reliance are are they're great examples that we might that a lot of members might not typically interact with. Um, Jeremy, you are am I uh, wrong in remembering? Did you also recently join the board for Digitunity, which is I, a I, new group? Tom, you would be a great uh, a TV show host um, with your interview skills because um, <laughs> you're right. Um, so Digitunity is a national organization um, that works to fund or works to advance um, uh, access to affordable devices. And so they fund a network of groups, um, a, an association of groups like PCs for People. And we are, I'm new on the board, so it's still a little fresh, but we're also uh, partnering um, to set up uh, more or less um, ecosystems in, in communities across the country. Unfortunately, Kansas City is not one of those right now, um, but really to help drive corporate donations to group like PCs for People, and then also help ensure that those devices are getting out into the community. Um, so Digitunity, um, like I said, is a group that, that funds, that works with organizations similar to Tom's. Fabulous. Uh, let me switch it over to the uh, educational institution side of things. And we've got a number of you listed in that category. Um, I won't call on you. Any of you want to volunteer to talk about uh, what resources, what interaction do you have with national resources on digital inclusion? I'll, I'll start, but really, uh, this is Tony. Um, what we have is a terrific asset named Leslie Scott, who keeps our Missouri broadband uh, uh, initiative across the system informed of what's going on nationally. And several of our members, I think, uh, interact with them more directly. Leslie's arranged for me to be on some calls with uh, the NDIA folks and like that. So we're, we clearly think there's a lot to learn from um, those organizations who've been doing this for a long time. And we try to catalog a lot of that and put it in um, a library on the Missouri Broadband Resource Rail that several of you have, have heard about that uh, I'll maybe mention a little bit uh, later. But that's we, we definitely are mindful that um, they can save a lot of us a lot of time. Um, and so with by being out ahead, if we pay attention to what they're producing. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up uh, in that context, Tony, um, because the, uh, the the NDIA has become a great a repository of, of uh, information available to anyone across the country. Um, and they really do go out of the, their way with their, um, uh, their listserv, their email um, um, database that just keeps people talking to each other literally multiple times on a daily basis. Um, even uh, when it comes to um, just uh, like for up, upcoming, the Digital Inclusion Week uh, is coming up here in two weeks. And there will be a lot of ways that uh, local groups will be able to participate and spread awareness, um, which we'll, we will be doing, by the way, um, uh, as a result of the work that NDIA is doing. So I appreciate that. Um, uh, Joe, at, at Link, I'm curious to know, do you or anyone uh, you work with at Link do you tap into any of the resources that the NDIA or any other national group provides to you in terms of the work that you guys are doing? 
I don't believe we do. Uh, I know that we uh, a lot of ways see ourselves as a conduit to the work that you do. You know, we're always trying to make sure uh, um, our families know what the resources are, the local resources and things. You know, we, um, um, but you know, the we we piggyback on the school districts that we work with. You know, they 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 already having to get everybody connected, and so okay. we really are just trying to support what they do. So I'm a, I'm not I'm not familiar with anyone. I know I don't, but I'm not. Well, I, I'm making a note, and I'm going to ask um, Wendy too as well. To uh, uh, there's some there's some interesting case studies and benchmarks um, of activities going on with school districts across the country that pop up every now and then on that NDIA listserv um, with with links to examples of different things that are going on. I'm thinking particularly about you know, places like Nashville and New York City and, um, and Columbus and Cleveland and Portland. And, um, you know, if, if, if that can be helpful for you in sharing with your colleagues at Link, um, I want to make sure that you at least um, have access to that. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, you bet. Um, and then, um, Scott, you and, and Mike, um, uh, Scott uh, Palmer and, and Mike, you um, uh, with with Rock Creek, you guys uh, might want to look into the resources at the NDIA, um, and their um, website is netinclusion.org um, uh, can provide. Um, and so I, I think you you'll find some interesting things there that benchmark um, across the country the kinds of things that we're we're doing here locally. Yeah, I've uh, been a member of NDIA for over a year now. Oh, good, excellent. Um, so, and um, I'm just gonna just reach over, um, Carrie Stewart, to the work that you've done. You've been such a champion for digital inclusion kind of from a funding perspective, but I'm just curious to know to what extent do you do any interacting with any national resources that help inform or influence um, the kinds of things that you work on? And, and that's okay if Carrie, if you're not available. Um, we obviously have a disproportionate number of nonprofits on this call. So I'm just gonna reach out to any of you um, who uh, may wanna share some input about any national resources that you um, interact with, uh, particularly for many of you that we haven't heard from so far in the nonprofit category. This is Leslie. Um, I've really gotten a lot out of the Shelby Coalition policy calls. Um, they just really stay on top of, of what's happening and um, explain it and also um, are, are looking at different facets of digital inclusion that I think you don't necessarily think about. And then um, of course, they they are self interested in in fiber, but uh, the the fiber uh, broadband association um, also ha has some useful uh, webinars on occasion. And of right. course, I just second um, NTIA. Um, yeah, as, as a valuable resource. N NTIA puts on a regular series of webinars and. Um, same way, like you mentioned with the Broadband Association. Um, so there's some things that could really shed some light on opportunities that are emerging. Um, I didn't know if um, I'm thinking of Rachel at, uh, at JFS or, or Mary Kay at Literacy KC, any of you guys, do you, um, to what extent do you look into or ever get influenced by things that are at the national level of resources for digital inclusion? For us, it's been very helpful to have this coalition. I was going to say, really, we interact mostly through um, KC Digital Drive as they have been a funding partner. And then also, whenever we're working one-on-one -on -one with clients, sometimes we're helping them navigate these national policy issues and how it actually relates to them, relating to their ISPs as well. Like, how do they sign up for this? What are they asking about? And that's a challenge. Um, I would love, um, as we see, hopefully an infrastructure bill passed that for the agencies who are working with individuals um, 
that we can have kind of like a working group or a learning group of some of our direct practice folks, whether it's social workers, community health workers, because that directly impacts um, some of their health and their um, social determinants of health, but is, is just complex. So I've been really appreciative to yeah. be a part of this group because it helps disseminate the national things the one that we are a part of, and again, this is more peer to peer, but is the National Jewish Human Service Agencies. A lot of um, Jewish human service agencies across the country have been implementing um, digital literacy or digital connection programs. But even then, I mean, the capacity to stay up to date is it's kind of challenging, so. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so, um, Tom, that Rachel reminded me um, and I don't know if this is in, in the spirit in which you're trying to gather information, but um, I think the FCC is, um, is another place that I do get information um, and the Benton Institute as well um, provides some great distillation of, um, of legislation that's being proposed and keeps us up to date on things too. I'm so glad you brought up the Benton Institute, Mary Kay, and that, you know, from a local nonprofit perspective, it's something that you've looked at and paid attention to. And I'm in the same boat. Um, there's so little um, kind of reliable data gathering and research being done in digital inclusion that that has been a source of some great white papers and some great research studies. Um, and the reason, the other reason I wanted to bring that up is because it's a great segue into moving toward uh, some talks about what's happening at a local level. Uh, and the reason I say that is because a, a starting point right off the bat um, is um, the regular involvement we've gotten, not only from Tony Lupino at UMKC, but the emerging effort that's coming out of Tony's work and, and the University of Missouri's work um, to help provide that, that local source of data gathering, research, and things like that. So I want to just um, kind of switch over to the local perspective on resources and have Tony uh, share with us a little bit about the work he's been doing, not just with the Missouri Broadband Resource Rail, but recently his working group has, uh, in conjunction working with Leslie, has started to put together a survey instrument to try to assess um, the work of coalitions, the work of information gathering and sharing, and start putting some data points behind it because as I mentioned, there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of funding emerging. And oftentimes to get at those funding opportunities, you need kind of a data-based uh, case statement to be made. So without any further ado, Tony, I wanna uh, hand over to you and just have you share with us for a few minutes the work that you guys are doing. I know there's a survey instrument. Uh, if you and Leslie wanna talk for a few minutes about it and see to what extent this group interaction here could add value to the work you're doing there. Sure, and I'd be happy to. Um, so let me, let me first, I think a lot of folks maybe wonder what, what exactly is the UMKC Digital Equity Working Group? So it's a more local version of the statewide initiative that we've talked about before with the Missouri Broadband Resource Rail. Uh, the way it developed was the chancellor's office uh, asked that I organize a group um, to focus in the Kansas City region as part of the Ruse Advocate for Community Change Initiative, which has a variety of programs, but to focus on broadband and digital equity, particularly in uh, disadvantaged and average low income uh, neighborhoods. So that's, that was the, the beginning of it. Um, we were well aware that there were the coalition has been at this for many, you know, many years and a lot of other people in the, uh, in the area. So the, the way we populated that group is we started with uh, several UMKC people who had not been regularly involved but have a lot to offer faculty and staff and some students. So we put a lot of UMKC folks on it. Then all the members of the steering council of the coalition, even though that meant they had to double up on meetings, what it does is it keeps the connectivity so we're not missing left hand, right hand uh, things. And then several other uh, people from government on both sides of the state line Community organizations we knew were actively involved, ASTEAM Village and the Hispanic Economic Development Corporation, um, the Du Bois Learning Center, 
uh, the Kaufman Foundation, Donnell has joined us, uh, Mid-America Regional Council, KC Rising, United Community Services of Johnson County, Wyandotte Health Foundation. So folks we knew were involved and then the way these things are, they're, they, you know, people then say, well, somebody else ought to be involved and that's great. So we've been kind of expanding it. Um, so anyway, we, we got to the point after several meetings of different themes where we'd hear a lot about, we really don't have the kind of grasp on what one of my, uh, former mentors would call the as is circumstances. So Tom was just alluding to that. How deeply do we really understand conditions that currently exist, where they came from, uh, what the objectives are and what data might already be available that people have. I've seen examples before where uh, well uh, capable and, and terrific nonprofit organizations were chasing the same data. It turned out somebody had it, it was willing to share it if you just knew that to save time. So. So what I'd like to do, Tom mentioned, I, what we did was is a tryout just within that working group. We tried a survey that actually had uh, 32 questions in it. So I know that sounds like a lot. Uh, we got a, a response rate of our membership of a little over half. Uh, it would take too long to go through the questions, but I will screen share the main categories. I think that might be useful. Um, Tom, did that come up? It is showing okay. up. Um... Yeah. yeah, you should you should be you should be open to share. Okay, so I think if it's up, is everybody seeing it? Yes. Okay. So um, the first set of questions was really it was and each one of these had several questions under it. Each of these these are the four main categories. We had some miscellaneous ones too. The first one was just sort of a reminder uh, that high speed internet is a tool, a really critical and important tool, but it's a tool towards the things we all know and 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 believe in: education, health, and safety participation in the economy um, and ubiquitously through all neighborhoods. But the, the questions were getting a little bit more at, well, how are you connecting what you're doing to uh, those outcomes? You know, how do, how do they relate directly or indirectly? And are we gathering information and data about, are we starting to move the needle or, or how should we be tracking moving the needle on those, those um, societal outcomes? Uh, we, I confess, and this is why we, we have not uh, disseminated the tool widely, it's a, a tryout that we will iterate. Uh, we got some pushback on the framing of some of those questions under that category. Um, so we're working on refining those to tighten them up. Um, the second one was uh, you know, more straightforward, which is we have some sense of the types of data we want. We have connectivity reports. They're based on data that sometimes, as is, is, uh, folks have said, is not as granular as we'd like on a household to household basis. So not just on connectivity, but on devices, on training, we're really trying to figure out who has, who has mapped what's already out there. Uh, and do you have studies or reports, whether you found them nationally or hopefully some more specifically on, in the KC region on both sides of the state line. So there were several questions getting at awareness of what's available and all these questions had comment boxes to say, you know, you ought to look at this. Um, and then the third one, which is I, I feel really strongly about, and I'm, I'm sure I've made this mistake myself in the past, which is you get exuberant about an initiative you believe in and you get going and you don't take enough time to stop and say, you know, others have been doing this already, what's already available. So I'm not, first of all, disrespecting what they've already done but more importantly, avoiding waste and, and creating collaboration opportunities. So a lot of this was, was about taking inventory, for lack of a better term. And we've, we've got a lot of information so far. We want to get more. And part of that will be to spread, you know, if people are interested in, in taking the survey, once we polish it up, uh, just asking everybody, what are you already doing? Now that um, relates a lot to what we tried to do with the Missouri Broadband Resource Rail. Some of you, I think, are familiar with SourceLink, formerly KC SourceLink. And the notion was um, not just to put up, you know, here's a website of an, of an organization that's doing good work, but to actually get what uh, Maria Myers and her team call resource profiles so that you get quite a bit of information about exactly what our different organizations doing. And you can navigate to it electronically by going through filters. So part of the goal is to have somebody, I mean, the university can help it, whoever wants to, to tackle this. If we get this raw data together about people and programs and assets in place, um, something to build a more local regional navigator, we think would be a, a good idea. So we're working toward, toward that. And then um, Leslie's been very instrumental in this, and I'm gonna invite her to comment as well. 
um, we sense, at least some of us do, I think Leslie and I for sure do, and, and others I've talked to as well, that a lot of times we're not seeing enough um, built-in evaluation mechanisms and what are the performance metrics gonna be to measure how we're doing with some of our initiatives. And so we asked some questions about uh, what are you already doing to evaluate success or progress? Uh, could, are there ways that uh, others could be helpful in, in helping you structure evaluation programs? And Leslie, why don't I, and, and so uh, the, to wrap up this, my little overview, we plan to make it a stronger survey after taking into account feedback we got just last this past Monday. And then if, uh, if the coalition steering committee would like to deploy it to the whole uh, group, that would be wonderful. And and, uh, and anybody else you'd suggest we send it to. Uh, but Leslie, you want to pick up on the last point or any of the above? Uh, real quick, Tony, before, before we get yeah. Leslie's input, I, I want to just uh, underscore one thing for this group. And it's something that you've mentioned um, as well. I mean, you're working on this. You've got, you know, you've got graduate students. You've got yeah. um, the student population of UMKC. Uh, which also has, uh, it's a very rich resource. And uh, one of the things I know that was uh, one of the questions that I noticed from the survey had to do with, you know, to what extent could, could we, meaning, you know, all of us who are on calls like this, who are doing our work, could we maybe benefit from doing projects that involve students who could yeah. help us better learn, you know, how to, how to capture data about the effectiveness of our programs. And, yeah. and I think things like that um, just represent a helpful resource that the university has, like right within our midst that maybe, you know, just you, a lot of us would never think to, you know, to access. And so I wanted to really underscore yeah. With a survey vehicle like this, without getting into the weeds on this particular survey, I want to make sure everyone gets the one takeaway is that, you know, we're sitting here with a fabulous resource of individuals who could, you know, just do projects to help you better assess and evaluate the work that we do. And I, and I can tell you firsthand, the students are anxious. To, you, we were all students at some point, and we were hoping yeah. to get out of the classroom and do stuff. The, the way I actually got into meeting the coalition was through a, a project-based class called Law, Technology, and Public Policy, where students were working with Rick Usher and others on things like, how are we going to regulate autonomous vehicles? And then one thing led to another. But yeah, we've had students do uh, read the fine print in some of these funding programs. One of the things on the Missouri Broadband Resource Rail is a funding sorter. So if you're looking for just help with digital training, click a few boxes and get to what's in the federal or state money for that. And we're trying to grow that. So yes, the students are an asset. So is the, you know, it's not just here, we have access to the statewide team of faculty, wonderful people from extension and engagement, Marshall Stewart, the vice chancellor for the system, Allison Copeland, who uh, runs engagement under Marshall have provided all these resources. And I know Leslie's actually working with some students uh, from Columbia. Um, so we had, it's uh, both locally and across the state. And again, it, you know, here, we're definitely looking at both sides of the state line as well. I wanna make that uh, clear. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Leslie? Yeah, so um, Tom, basically I was gonna say what you said. <laughs> yeah, well. So, um, just, just playing TV host, as Jeremy says. <laughs> yes. Um, so, I mean, just a couple of things. Um, first of all, I was an MPA student at UMKC, and um, as part of the, the curriculum, there's a, a program evaluation course. So, you know, right there is, is a, a group of students, and, and um, you know, I had Dr. Never, and he engaged with organizations in, in the community uh, to, to put some frameworks together. And I, I think that, you know, one of the, Tony aside and, and, and you know, others aside uh, who, who do uh, great community engagement, Jake Wagner is, is another uh, professor who's highly engaged with the community. But, but by and large, um, this has changed, of course, with the, the new um, Office of Community Engagement. But when, when I was at UMKC, I was frustrated by what I perceived as, as kind of a, a lack of, of engagement on a, a wide scale from on the part of the university. So, um, you know, in addition, when Colin Reinsmith came around to Kansas City and talked to Michael Limita, 
one of the things that Michael uh, said was, you know, we don't have the resources uh, to evaluate our programs. And, and I think that that yeah. ranges anywhere from, from funding to, uh, to just the skill set to the tools, whatever. So, um, you know, program evaluation as a career is, is a very lucrative field. So providing students with the opportunity to do some hands-on projects, um, yeah. you know, that, that can lead that, them into that uh, career probably with a yeah. more focused training would be, um, you know, great opportunity. So it's, it's, a, it's a definitely a great resource. Um, and, and as we're talking about that, I, I want to direct a couple comments back to um, Scott Pomeroy and Mike Heckman again, because I know you guys are working on and working with groups who are trying to help make access to funding opportunities easier um, with respect to, you know, particularly, I mean, at the local level, I, I just wanted to call to your attention as we're talking about these resources, I put a link in the chat. I don't know if you guys are able to access it. Uh, it's a video that was posted on a Facebook page of one of our regular coalition members, Ike Graham, who's, uh, who's not on today's call, but here's a, uh, you know, a local neighborhood association um, in a, uh, uh, one of the relatively low income neighborhoods on the east side of Kansas City. And, um, and uh, I would say not partly, but largely as a result of their um, interaction with this group, uh, they, have, uh, they have acquired devices. I know they regularly get support from the, the Kansas City Public Library's tech access group. The, link that I put in the chat is actually a video that Ike posted of one of their regular di digital literacy training programs that they're running in their local neighborhood center. Um, you know, it's and just, and that's an outstanding example of a guy and an organization who would probably never think that they would be, you know, eligible or qualified to get a university student to come and help them, you know, assess all the different things they've done and the people that they've touched and the impact that they've had on people's lives. But, um, but those are the kind of things that I would love to see, um, you know, more broadly disseminated as a result of our work. And I just wanted to call that out as one of the examples of things that really are happening at a local level as a result of, you know, doing coalition work, but they maybe sometimes don't get as as noticed as you might think, or get the recipients of those services themselves to realize how much more that they have available to access. Um, and, you know, particularly as, as these, you know, large federal and state funded programs come up, you know, a guy like Ike Graham on his own might not ever think that, you know, the Vineyard Neighborhood Association would be eligible to qualify for some of that funding, but they should. And, uh, I just wanted to have that cut in as a way to prompt some of the input that we're asking for right now, which is basically how do you or any of the clients or groups that you work with, how do you interact with local resources? I mean, obviously we have the coalition, we have UMKC, what other local resources come into play in the work that you do and you've worked with. Um, I, I know Carrie Stewart, before I called on you, I don't know if you're still on the call. I wanted to see if you had um, anything to add. And if you're, you're not, I'm gonna change course. And I wanna go over to Tracy um, uh, at the health department because we've worked with you so regularly, Tracy, and I know we've had events and things like that. Just curious to know your input on resources outside of the city um, that you touch base with or who help affect or influence the work you do? Um, so I um, belong to a few uh, public PTI and right now the doggone initials, the names is escaping me, but I do mm -hmm. work with them. And I know our leadership team here at the health department, they work with different uh, health coalitions, uh, National Association of Public Health and, and different uh, funding sources come through those associations. Excellent. Um, and I and can get you the exact names. 
Um, I probably should have been better prepared. I apologize. No, no, that's that's okay. I, the, another thing I wanted to bring up. I mean, I I know we've been we've had activities at the health department. Uh, for instance, every year about this time, um, groups like UPS, um, they've done hiring fairs um, for their seasonal. Um, you know, they've got to have a lot of people help deliver packages and they've held a couple of hiring fairs at the health department. And the reason I bring it up is because it was a great venue for people to come in and realize they needed to have an online resume. And, and, you know, we had staff and volunteers working with us on behalf of the health department to provide help. So people who showed up and didn't have an online resume could sit down on the spot and get one put together get interviewed and walk out of there with a job. Um, and you know, if you think that's just about getting a job, you're wrong because what happened is you could just see their whole constitution changed when they walked out of there realizing that they had a job. I mean, people were in tears of joy uh, and think what that does for just their overall lifestyle. And, and so uh, just the way that a group like the health department interacts with the impact of digital inclusion, I think is immense. Um, so uh, anyone else who wants to share, you know, the type of interaction you're doing, not just with the coalition, but any other local groups. thinking, who haven't we heard from so far? Steve Chu, we missed you on the introductions. Are you still with us, Steve? Good morning, I apologize, I was pulled away. I, if you had called on me, I, I'm sorry. No problem. Yeah, share with us a little bit about um, your background and, and our discussion today about interacting with um, uh, digital inclusion resources, both on the national and the local level. Sure. So. Uh, Tom, you, you had I recently introduced you to our uh, government affairs team. I'm, I'm I work at Microsoft and I'm on the sales uh, side of things and work with the state governments in Missouri and Iowa. Uh, but we have I have uh, peers that work um, in in the community, helping with some of the work that Microsoft is doing to help people that don't have access to internet in rural and urban areas through some of the IP that we own around the air bay, the uh, the TV white space. And uh, definitely working with your organization and others, Tom, to really help in scenarios where that technology works and can augment what's already being done. That's great, Steve. Yeah, and I um, I, I didn't want to uh, get too much into the fact that PCs for People is developing a strong working relationship with Microsoft, but it's a fact, uh, and particularly the Microsoft Airband Initiative is something that uh, you know. There's there's a lot of publicly available knowledge about that on the website, um, and and we've we've really benefited from the a growing partnership with Microsoft uh, in a number of capacities. Um, one thing, Steve, I didn't share with you guys, and you know, bringing this to the local level, um, Microsoft and, and Tony uh, and Leslie, I haven't shared this with you guys as well, but Microsoft has also begun a pretty intensive research initiative um, uh, upon the realization that a lot of their software products in particular uh, are developed with, without a lot of outreach to uh, minority com communities and um, you know, kind of marginalized populations that they typically that typically aren't represented necessarily in the, you know, among the developers who are actually making these products. And we've held two research studies um, now here in Kansas City and PCs for People as a group has held six kind of focus group studies uh, across cities like Cleveland, Denver, Atlanta, and Kansas City, um, uh, interacting with individuals and small business owners, um, Latino community, African-American community, uh, Native American communities, uh, really helping Microsoft product development um, uh, staff, um, you know, develop greater insights about how people in different scenarios uh, utilize and could better be served by technology products. So uh, we're thrilled with that partnership, Steve, and, and hoping to, to see and hear more and, and share more in this forum about the, the things that Microsoft as a corporation uh, is doing to, to help us with our digital inclusion work. So I appreciate you joining us. 
Um, so we're, we've got about 20 minutes left in this scheduled time. I wanna literally open the floor to anyone um, on this call who maybe just has some input to share. If it's, even if it's not about the topics that we've been addressing in the agenda. Um, as I said, we're nothing if not flexible. And I wanna make sure we use this time to, to satisfy you know, any of the outreach um, uh, needs or interests that any of you have. So I'm gonna open it up to any of you who feel like cutting in. Tom, I might mention that um, Digistory has partnered with Thank You Walt Disney, the group that owns the Laugh-O-Gram building. You know, our goal is to really build that whole digital media industry in Kansas City. And ultimately, our goal is to, to really reach kids, especially in that surrounding area around 31st and Troost. And one of the ways we function locally is to establish our own network of stakeholders in that industry and in that talent pipeline that will reach out to that community. And so we've developed an organization, a, a kind of a, uh, not a group called the Kansas City Institute for Media Animation and Graphic Innovation in Education, KC Imagine. And it consists of 15 area colleges, uh, um, several uh, digital media firms, career, high school career programs, that's been the most effective way we've been able to work locally to, to help grow something that's a, kind of a specialized area of digital media. So we've kind of had to kind of grab the, the bull by the horns in our own way to find what those local connections can be. And it has really helped us in reaching out to kids in the urban core with like career uh, activities and providing finding volunteers who want to work with those kids in programs like Ignition Lab, which are coming up soon at Operation Breakthrough. Uh, that's great, Ron. Um, yeah, it, it, and I'm glad you brought up the Ignition Lab as well, because Caddy Corner uh, across the street from where uh, uh, the work Ron's doing at the at the old Laughagram Studio Building, that's just right in that corridor of the 31st and Troost intersection. Uh, Operation Breakthrough has just opened um, uh, a new part of their building that's called the Ignition Lab. And if you're a Travis Kelsey fan, um, you'll see regular pictures and videos of Travis sporting his uh, Ignition Lab shirts and hoodies that the kids are actually making in the studio. Um, and they are um, they're developing coursework um, you know, with industry uh, educators on everything from graphic design, uh, you know, uh, uh, automotive, you know, mind drive building cars, um, fabrication, um, you know, environmental uh, studies, uh, green tech, uh, PCs for people is doing a refurbishing and recycling uh, lab. Um, and uh, again, you know, looking back at, at Mike and, and Scott and the, and the work that you guys uh, do and see across both local and national landscapes. I mean, these are the kinds of groups that we want to make sure when we're accessing this emerging funding coming out of infrastructure bills and all this other uh, funding that, that these smaller local groups um, find ways to get to tap into that funding so that whether they need extra help with devices or um, stronger internet signals or training tools or em, you know, employee volunteers from big corporations to come in and participate, um, that we can find a way to make them aware and get them included in the kind of daisy chain of networks that need to be involved in, in accessing and receiving those funds uh, to further perpetuate their work. Um, so uh, fabulous examples. Um, and uh, with just a, a few minutes left in our regularly scheduled time, I, I just wanna, I wanna turn the, the final few comments toward um, you know, this group and this interaction and, and what do we get out of having this monthly coalition meeting? Um, how can this, this group, the Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion um, you know, provide values so that when you join this 90 minute call once a month, first Friday of every month, um, just curious to know off the top of your head, you know, what would you suggest? How could we do better? What do you like? What do you dislike? Just round table, 
let's go across the board and I'll, I'll leave it open to you guys. And Wendy and I are capturing any input you can provide to us. So uh, Tony, you got your hand up. I'll call on yeah. you first. Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt the flow before, but you raised a very, in my mind, a very important example when you mentioned Ike and Vineyard. Um, okay. when, when, we're, when several of us are saying, let's take inventory, that may sound pedestrian, but it's critically important. What Ike's doing should not be below the radar. It's right. better for the community if we collectively get his work and that of other organizations, especially those that are embedded right in neighborhoods on the radar so that we can help direct funding and scale it. And also at the same time, learn from it and say, well, how can this work in, in other neighborhoods on both sides of the state line? And so there's an ask in there, which is this, if we do send this survey out, uh, it'll be a pain. It'll take some time to fill out. But the point is, and, and don't, and please don't, if you do uh, engage with it, don't assume somebody else is telling us about these organizations. Just we, we can, we, that's one of the beauties of having the students who can sort through it. Go ahead and, and report in it. You really ought to be talking to Ike or any you know, or similar organizations. Once we have that, we have the tools to, to connect up so people can navigate to, to those organizations. So that is an ask. And I know I, when I get surveys sent to me, it's like, oh, another survey. But we're going to ask for your indulgence in that for the common good. I, I, I love it, Tony. And I'm, I'm looking at Steve with Microsoft. I know you, got, you work with other groups besides ours. Um, I'm thinking of Jill uh, in Douglas County and Lawrence. I mean, this applies to any of you who are on this call. Uh, uh, Rachel uh, with JFS, you guys work with a lot of groups. And to the extent that you're aware that we've got these information gathering tools, um, it would be so helpful for our efforts if you had an easy mechanism for sharing back with us, um, you know, individuals in small groups who are doing some things that they really deserve the opportunity to get included or folded into some of these funding opportunities that, that are coming about. And the only other example I can give you, and, and Mike and Scott, I'm pointing back to you guys again, an example of something that was really very effective about four or five years ago, we had a digital inclusion fund and it was really catalyzed by Google Fiber. And I know they're not on this call, but Google Fiber working with the city of Kansas City, Missouri um, and it made funds available for as little as, you know, $2,500 grants or $1,000 grants to groups that would write in with a specific need that they, um, they could access that little bit of a boost. Um, and, and I know Rick Usher from the city is, has retired. He's stepped off of the steering council, but we, we lack that input that could help generate that type of, of funding source. But um, as more of these funding opportunities are coming available, we can do that work by making sure people are included. Rachel, I'll, I'll call on you. I know you've, I've got, I know you've got your hand up and then, and then we'll hear from Mike because uh, you raised your hand as well. So Rachel, you go first. I just wanted to mention too, I mean, one of the ways that we've been um, trying to make some connections is just like showing up and doing the, some of these listening sessions. But we also recognize as a medium-sized nonprofit, but like our partnerships, we don't have the capacity to cultivate all of them as meaningfully as we want. So we've been really trying to figure out how we collaborate better. Um, one thing that I often hear fully left out a little bit um, when we talk about digital literacy is the older adult population. And so if anyone does really want to talk through that, we are ending our Tech Connect program at the end of 2021 it's sunsetting what we had been doing was I think we our goal was 100 it took a lot more um, time than we expected but I think we're going to end with having connected 80 older adults to tablets and internet and they get to keep the tablets and we've had support they get a year's at least help of internet um, provision if that was needed and then we did intensive like 10 week classes with them. And so we've learned a heck of a lot through that um, interaction over the past year and a half. So if anybody is trying to work with older adults, I mean, it does come with challenges, but it's not um, something that I think we should leave out because that access portion, I mean, it, it connects to everything. So whenever we're thinking about not reduplicating and not reinventing the wheel, it's not something that we are gonna be able to continue 
um, right now because staffing was a huge challenge. But I did want to put that out there that I think we could be a real asset if anyone is trying to figure out some of the more complicated challenges of working with older adults. And I mean, that's even folks like I would say we classify it as 60 plus, but even folks 50 plus who just haven't had access to internet or keeping up with technology that they're also in a similar position, um, but they don't necessarily get encompassed in the school or the education or the workforce um, partnerships always. And they're kind of a little bit left out. So terrific, terrific input. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Mike, let's call on you. I know you've had your hand up and then we'll talk to uh, to Hunjin from KU, because I, I do want to hear from you on the work you do with the Center for Digital Inclusion. But Mike, you go first. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So, you know, I'm just, I'm reacting to your question. I, I, you know, I, this is my, my first uh, opportunity to participate in this meeting. And so I have a data point of one uh, <laughs> acknowledged here. Um, but, but you said, hey, what, what else can be done at meetings like this to make, to make them more productive? And again, with only a data, data point of one, that in consideration of my comment, but I think, you know, the, the inventory and the discussions about who's talking to whom, what kind of things are going on, what are the success stories that are out there, those have been, for me personally, really helpful and kind of dominated this conversation. Um, one thing that I think would be not instead of, but in, in addition to really helpful, and actually Rachel touched on this just a second ago, is what's, what, what are the barriers? What's keeping things from happening? Are there resource constraints, which Rachel just mentioned? Are there financial constraints? Probably, but what do those look like? Are they, is it capital? Is it human capital? Is it time? Um, are there know-how constraints? Um, just amongst, you know, the folks that are on this, on this call to, to go accomplish A, you know, A and B, is it, are there access constraints in terms of not digital access, but accessing the right, you know, decision maker, you know, in, in you know, an XYZ scenario. So that, I think that could be an interesting dynamic if, if it hasn't been included in the past is, because uh, th this group seems like it covers a broad swath of probably perspectives and, and networks that exist within the community and, and, and perhaps unlocking some doors or helping folks get through those doors could be productive. That is just a treme tremendous input, Mike. I, I will tell you, we have, um, uh, from my personal point of view, suffered a little bit in the past on some of our meetings from doing too much talking at the participants. You know, we line up two or three speakers and here's the topic and boom, we just provide information. And we always get the best feedback from these meetings when they involve more people sharing more stories about what they're getting, what they're having trouble getting, why they're having trouble getting it, and you know where and how they can find ways to solve those problems. Um, so if we can get, I'm clearly hearing from you, if we can get better at, uh, at structuring those types of interactions and questions and outputs, um, we'll, we'll be better able to um, help help individuals and organizations uh, identify and overcome some of those barriers. Um, uh, uh, Hunton, I'll call on you because you've got your um, hand up as well. I don't want to cut your time too, too much. Yes, thank you. I will be brief. Um, I had to step out for about 20 minutes, so I don't know whether this was discussed, but with regard to the KC digital inclusion role, I think we have tremendous opportunities for educating future generations of digital inclusion advocates. And uh, you know, in a, through our center, we work with undergraduate students and graduate students in terms of working directly with marginalized populations with regard to digital inclusion, but also um, encourage graduate students to do research on this topic. And Tom, you were a panelist for the workshop we put together. And you know, at the time, one of the professors mentioned we want to invite people from the K, uh, KC Digital Coalition to kind of share insights about what, what's taking place. What is the problem? What are the solutions that we are exploring? So I think that closer uh, collaboration between academic institutions and the nonprofit organizations and other policymakers in this area would be really helpful. And I also want to mention that in, in the School of Journalism Mass Communications at KU, we have capstone campaigns project that we worked with uh, 
Kansas City, Missouri mayor's office and also Google Fiber with regard to digital inclusion aspect. So there are opportunities for students to provide uh, some, some recommendations and, and actually work that you can actually utilize in terms of promoting the wonderful work you do. Thank you. Wonderful input, uh, Hunchin. And, um, and I know that there is a pathway to get more students involved, um, in, not just in tech, but in learning to become advocates for digital inclusion. Um, very brief anecdote. Um, last night at the Ignition Lab that we talked about over at Operation Breakthrough, it was the first open house for about 16 high school students to get to walk around and see the different um, topics that are gonna be covered so they can pick which modules they wanna be involved in as part of their after school programming. And the three or four kids I interacted with with regard to computer refurbishing, and I sat there with a, a laptop that had the back taken off and we were looking at all the different parts and pieces and the motherboards and the um, um, you know processors and, like these kids not only wanted to get involved in it so that they could be, um, you know, the ace in the hole that their family and friends rely on to fix all their computers, but they saw the need to help other people learn how important it was. And just having that awareness um, that, you know, there is a pathway to not just learn about tech, but to actually become involved in something called digital inclusion. I mean, we've never had... Uh, that type of ability to be to have so many people aware of what that means as we do right now. Um, so, you know, finding ways to say, well, well, what are the, like Mike said, what are the obstacles preventing us from doing that? And what could we put together to make that a, you know, a, a more prominent pathway for people to learn about and, and to want to go into that field. So um, anyone else, I don't see anyone with their hands raised on the um, on the field, but I know there's a number of you we haven't heard from or just any other input uh, and not that, you know, we have to fill the time, but I just want to make sure that we're not denying any of you who have further input to, to share with us. All right. Well, listen, uh, we have collected some great notes. Uh, Wendy, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to share just relative to what we've captured. Um, I also need your help, Wendy, making sure we capture the comments in the chat, because I don't want to lose those. Absolutely. Um, I already got it. We're going to be saving okay. this entire recording, <laughs> the chat included. And I've actually already put the uh, link to our whiteboard, our Miro board in the chat. Um, in case anybody, you know, has some ideas later, you can actually just go right on in and, and add some more resources for everyone. And we will include all of this in our follow up newsletter next week. Uh, thank you so much. And I know what we'll, one thing that will be included in that newsletter, as I mentioned earlier, is digital inclusion week, uh, with some some nice fun graphics and um, hashtags and different um, video testimonials and just a, a fun way to uh, reinforce this growing awareness of the work that we're doing. Um, uh, Mike uh, Heckman, I know I'm going to be heading back toward you and the work that you're doing um, with uh, uh, particularly with Mid-America Regional Council and um, Casey Rising and other groups that are trying to link uh, the work we're doing here and with UMKC into this. But th there's a number of important follow-ups that are going to benefit from the input that you guys have provided today. So um, I'm just going to give one more call out if anyone has any more insights to share. I don't have an insight. Yes, exactly. Megan uh, beat me to the punch. Um, so next week is Digital Inclusion Week, and so I just encourage people to participate in that if um, if they're interested, or at least follow it and see what's happening. Yes, Tom, if I can add on to that. Hi, everyone. Megan McNaughton again. Uh, Kansas City Public Library. It's very excited for Digital Inclusion Week. We have classes going on every day of the week. Um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday from 12 to 1, and then on Thursday from 5.30 to 7.30. I'll put our website in the chat, so feel free to check out our website. We have all the resources and information there, um, and if you have any questions about it, feel free to get in touch with us, and I'd love to talk to you more about it. 
And NDIA has a toolkit, I think, as well. So that's right. That's a great resource. And they have right. some uh, webinars, and I just posted the link in the chat for their uh, Digital Inclusion Week page if you need more information. Fabulous. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you're if you're not aware, it is Red Friday. The Kansas City Chiefs football team <laughs> is playing, hoping to turn around their fortunes this weekend. So. Uh, have a great rest of your day and a wonderful weekend, and uh, uh, we appreciate your participation. We'll see you at our next month's meeting, which is Friday, November the 5th. So thanks again for joining us, and uh, we'll see you then. Take Bye, care. Bye-bye. Thank you.